Let's get started tonight in John chapter 1. We're going to start at verse number 14, but uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you for this time together. We ask you to bless this and allow the revelation of who you are to continue to come forth. We'll be careful to give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to attempt to get through the rest of John chapter 1 today. And uh, we got up through John chapter 1 verse 13. And we mentioned some things last week, uh, actually two weeks ago as well, um, about the, the difference between the Trinitarian doctrine and the doctrine of what is known as the oneness doctrine. And uh, I come from a oneness background. Um, and, and really, when you talk to just a normal person, not a theologian, not somebody that wants to debate, it really comes down just to some terminology. But there is some power, obviously, into knowing who the Lord is. And so before we get to our notes, I want to just give you some, a, a very, I'm not a good drawer, obviously, but I want to give you uh, a couple of reasons why I am not, I do not come and do not believe in a Trinitarian doctrine. Okay, there's a couple of principles within a Trinitarian doctrine that um, you have to understand. A Trinitarian will believe that uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existing, which means they were always there. Now, if you talk to most Trinitarians, they will tell you they're one God. Okay, they believe one God, but they have three persons within that God. Okay, the flip side is the, of the oneness is there is one God that reveals himself to us in different forms. And uh, so it's a slight difference, but yet it's a powerful difference. And I'm hoping that this illustration will kind of show you what I'm talking about. Okay, that's, that's my spirit. Okay, so that's God. Uh, John 4, 24. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We're going to talk about it here when we get to um, verse 18, I believe. No man can see God. No man will ever see God because God is a spirit. Unless God figures out a way to reveal him, not figures out a way, unless he uses a way. I'm sure he can figure it out. But to, to reveal himself to us. In the Old Testament, he revealed himself in a couple of different ways temporarily. So when you read the angel of the Lord, sometimes he, he, or when the men came and talked to Abraham, I believe that was a manifestation of God, but it was what was called a theophany, a temporary manifestation of God. Okay. I'm, tonight we're talking about a permanent representation or revelation of God. So God has a spirit. Now, it is a spirit, ultimately. Okay. And then, so for a Trinitarian, again, Pardon the wonderful drawing. So what a Trinitarian will say is there's one God and that there's three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? And they're co-equal, co-eternal, co-existing. Um, and so, but when you talk to somebody about this doctrine right here, ultimately they come to a conclusion if you ask the right questions where they'll make a statement, something to this effect. God is incomprehensible. You just, you just have to take it by faith. You can't comprehend that concept, if you will, okay? Because here's the thing. Uh, we'll just say that this is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Here, here's the thing that, some of the questions that I've asked that nobody's been able to really answer to for me, okay? When we read in Scripture, we're going to talk about this in John, because the book of John, this is what John is all about. He's revealing who God is manifest in Christ. Okay, the Word become flesh. We talked about that some last week. That's, that's almost the whole underlying foundation of the book of, uh, of the Gospel of John, is to reveal who Jesus is. Okay, so in order to believe what some of the things that are read, for instance, when the Bible says, this is my only begotten Son, Who's talking in that? Okay? The Trinitarians will tell you, well, that's God the Father. 
The problem is, so God the Father begets God the Son. The problem is, is the Bible says it was the Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary. So how can the Father be the Father and the Son be the Son if the Holy Ghost is what overshadowed Mary and Mary conceived and gave birth? Okay? If they are co-equal, how come the Son had to leave heaven to come to earth and not the other two? Okay? If they're co-equal. And the Bible, and, and Jesus says while he's walking on earth, I'm about my Father's business. Well, if he's about his father's business, that means he's in a subservient role. But if they're co-equal, why is he submitting to his father? Okay, unless there's something different going on than this concept right here. Okay, the other thing that I, the reason why I don't like the Trinitarian doctrine is because it makes it very confusing for people to know how to approach God. It, 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 you're guessing. Well, who do I pray to at this time? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And if I say God, am I talking to all three? And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost is nowhere mentioned in Scripture. The word Trinity is nowhere mentioned in Scripture. The only thing that's mentioned in Scripture is our God is one. And God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? So, to me, there's got to be another explanation because who's the one that saves us? Is it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost? And if somebody says, well, it's all three, well, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that God has become our salvation. So which part of God became our salvation, the Father, Son, or the Holy Ghost? Okay, you see what I'm saying? How can, and that's why if you keep asking these questions, eventually a trend will change, so you just have to take it by faith. Okay? We're going to read in here, the Bible says that when John is preaching, John says, that the, there comes one after him, referring to Jesus, the Son of God, referring to him that he's going to baptize us with the Holy Ghost. Well, if they're co-equal, how come the Holy Ghost has to do what Jesus tells it to do? And if they're co-equal, why does Jesus have to tell the Father? Because later in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'll, I'll pray the Father and he shall send the Holy Ghost. Mass confusion, isn't it? <laughs> That's what Trinitarians will say. Yeah, so if you go to a Trinitarian church, which there's a lot of assemblies of God or Trinitarian based, uh, several of them are. Um, but this is this is where they this is what they say. And they'll tell you that they are a one God church because they, they do believe in one God, but there's three persons in the Godhead. Um, and the, there, there's, so there's a lot of questions that are, you know, which part of God are you going to see? When we get to heaven because there's only one third of God or the one person of the three people that have a body that's like unto yours and mine and that's the son so when we get to heaven are we only going to ever see the son and not the father of the spirit so that that's why I get confused with this so now I want to take it to a oneness perspective that means a whole lot more at least to me and hopefully through revelation to you. So you've got God as a spirit. Okay? God is a spirit. Now, how that God reveals himself to us is different here. Because now at Bethlehem, and we talked a little bit about this, about the blueprint and the plan last week, and, and the envisaged Christ and how creation was made with Christ in mind. Now you have Jesus Christ at Bethlehem okay but it's not just Jesus Christ because Colossians 2 9 oops that's a C Colossians 2 9 says in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily which means all of God is actually residing himself in the man Christ Jesus and so when I now look at Jesus Christ I'm seeing all of God I'm not seeing one third. I'm not seeing just God the Son. I'm seeing the physical representation and revelation of the Almighty God. It's the reason why John writes in Revelation, Jesus speaking, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, that which was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Okay? So if he's going to claim that, what's he claiming? He can't claim that he's Almighty if he's only one third. 
he can only claim almightiness if he's all of God. Okay? Which means a whole lot more to me because God is the one that came to earth. Okay? Now, so in the Old Testament, God revealed himself to man in several different ways. Okay? Through the cloud by day, the fire by night, through the Ark of the Covenant, the glory cloud would come down upon the, te the temple or the tabernacle. Uh, theophanies were there um, as well. And so in the Old Testament, you had glimpses of God through symbols of things that were earthly. Okay? But then when Jesus came, God revealed himself. And so our, our connect point with God now is through the man Christ Jesus. Okay? And then John chapter 7 you have the Holy Ghost. Okay? And John chapter 7, and we'll, we'll deal, that, deal with it more in depth when we get to John 7, but the, the Bible says the Holy Ghost was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. There was no Holy Ghost until Jesus was glorified. And here's the reason why there was no Holy Ghost till the, till Jesus was glorified is because the Holy Ghost is the blending of humanity and deity and the risen Christ, the man, now resides in us by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, does that make sense? Are you following along? Okay, here's the other reason why this is important to understand is because when you see father-son relationship within scripture, it, it's not talking like me as a father to, to Owen as a son. Okay, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about deity to humanity. Okay, and then when Jesus was raised from the dead and his body changed, he was able to walk through walls and appear into the 12 and, and then he ascended up into heaven. He went back into spirit form, if you will, but he had the price that was paid, which was the flesh of, of God. Okay, does that make sense so far? So let me take it one step further. And, and, and again, this is foundational to get us through the rest of John. Okay, why is this more accurate than this when it comes to preparing us for, for heaven? Okay, and, and, and for lack of a better term, for us being saved, okay? Or us getting back to what was lost. Somebody tell me what was lost in the garden. Relationship, Relationship with God, the, the spirit of God, the God as a spirit. Adam and Eve had communion with God as a spirit back then. That was broken. And when that was broken, man could not get to God. It's, and you read it all through the Old Testament. There was the, the best example is when Moses asked to see God and God said, you can't see me or you're going to get consumed. So I'll hide you in a rock and you'll see just the, the remaining parts as I walk by, okay? So that was broken. So God came up with a way to get us back to communion with him, and what that is is humanity, okay? So God takes upon himself this humanity and gets us to, to us, okay? So he, in his humanity, becomes a bridge, if you will. Turn real quick to 1 Corinthians 15. the first fruits afterward they that are Christ at his coming. This is talking about being risen and ascending. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. 
But when he saith all things are put under his under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, I know that that can sound confusing. So let me just walk you through it this way. What this is saying is that you and I still need to have the role of a mediator. First Timothy 3, who is the blessed and only potentate, God manifest in the flesh. Uh, he is the mediator. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Okay, that's not separate. That's God's humanity. Okay, God's humanity is still the bridge that gives us the communion with him. But when we are changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal at the coming of the Lord in the twinkling of an eye, if you read earlier in chapter 15, it's going to happen like that when he calls us home. Our bodies shift. There's a change in us. We become what Jesus was after he was raised from the dead. And when Jesus calls us home, there's no more need for the mediator because everything is taken care of. All things are done and we'll see God all in all. Okay. Well, how are we going to see him? We're going to see him in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay. And the role of the mediator will no longer be needed because we are dwelling in the presence of what was originally spirit. Okay. And, and so, so going back to the difference here is a Trinitarian will separate all that stuff. A, a oneness person will say, God did all of this, but he's big enough to, to reveal himself in different ways. So when you look at the father son relationship in scripture, when it talks about, I'm about my father's business, it's not talking person to person. It's talking substance to substance. That which was created, which is humanity, is serving that which was not created, which was deity. The Son was created. It's another reason why you can't have co-eternal, co-equal beings, because one creates the other. One begets the other. Okay? So when it says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, it's not this gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not the third person that overshadows Mary. It's God as a spirit. All of God overshadows Mary, and they conceive and have a son named Jesus, humanity, and what it's what we call the incarnation, the, the blending of deity and humanity at the at the, the manger of Bethlehem is when humanity takes or deity takes on humanity, or in King James Version, God is manifest in the flesh. In John, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? So when he did the tabernacle, was he not the spirit, but the man who took the purpose? There's one on the throne. Okay. We'll see Jesus. I don't know if I mean, when they said, well, he was thinking of what Jesus said on the cross. Why would he do that? Why would he do this person? Okay, that's a perfect example. If he is a second person, how, how God can't die. He's a spirit, right? So did God die on the cross? His humanity died. Okay? But if he's one-third of the Godhead, that means one-third of God died that day. Right? But it's impossible for deity to die. So what was dying on, the, on Calvary but his humanity? It's the same thing when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, Not my will, but thy will be done. As a man born of Mary... He had a human will, and his human will succumbed to his divine will. Just like you and I today, we have a human will, and he has given us a divine will. Which one are we going to listen to? Jesus just listened better than we did. Okay? Right. Yeah. And that's why when I was raised in the, in the church I was raised in, it was a massive, we call it the upside down arc. It's huge. If you drive in Oak Hill, you'll see it from I-94. But on the platform over on this side, a uh, pastor put up there, he did not send someone else to save the world. On this side, he said he came himself. Okay. The father didn't send the son, which lets, it, it makes the love of God 
much stronger. You know, I mean, think about it. I love you so much. I love Dwayne so much, and I want Dwayne to, to have communion with me, so I'm going to send Randy to die. <laughs> okay? Instead of saying, I love Dwayne so much, and I want to have a relationship with Dwayne, that I'm going to become like Dwayne to create a pathway for Dwayne to get back to me. It's going to be my love that initiates it. Okay, does that, does that make sense? And to me, it makes it, it makes the concept of who God is much more personal and much stronger and much more powerful than if the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And, and as we go through, John, you're going to see that. But if the way that I have learned how to look at this is the Father, Son terms in Scripture. The, the term Father is P-A-T-E-R. It's where we get paternal from in, in the Greek. But it doesn't necessarily just mean a father. It means an originator. Okay? So when they're using the word, the term father, a lot of times you can use the original. Okay? Or the originator. Well, who originated all things? God. Okay? And, and, then, what, and then when I think of the son, it's not just a male offspring. It is something that is begotten okay and so to me when i read that it's talking about the humanity of the lord okay so the father is the divine or deity role divinity role the son is his role as a human and only god can do this and that's why the bible says he is emmanuel god with us okay when that is said it's talking about jesus so when you look at the baby at Bethlehem, it's really God becoming man. Does that make sense? And so in verse 14 here is where John starts, starts doing it. Let me also, let me just take two more minutes because I thought of something this week. And I actually saw it posted, and so it triggered something in my, my mind when it comes to this. What was the devil's main objective? To be like God okay and everything that he has done has given up he's, he's, he's called uh, an angel of light in some way he, he there's a little bit of truth in everything that Satan does because Satan was created by God okay so there's a little bit of truth in everything that, but he's wanting to be like God but here's the thing that got so that struck me this week when I saw this post is do you realize that in Scripture Satan is referred to as the father of lies, the son of perdition, and an evil spirit. But nobody has ever claimed that Satan is a trinity. Father, son, spirit. Father of lies, son of perdition, evil spirit. But nobody, no theologian has ever gone out on a limb and said, Satan is a trinity. Okay, why? Because he's not. It's just different roles that he played in that moment. He was a father of lies. He's a son of perdition. He's an evil spirit, but it's still Satan. Okay, God manifests himself sometimes as a father, which is deity. Okay, which when you come up out of the waters of baptism next Sunday, the person that comes out will be born of the spirit. We, were, we talked about that last week, not of the will of men, not of, okay, that's, that's the father in his deity role. But you couldn't even get to that unless he had his humanity role on Calvary, making the way for us to get to that. And then the gift of the Holy Ghost is a purifier, a sanctifier, a guide, a comforter, all kinds of different things. Okay? And so, uh, but it's all the same God. Fulfilling the role. It's the reason why you can cry. You know, one of the other things I've asked people, I said, well, if God is, if God the Father is the Father, why does the Bible say that Jesus is the Father? Well, what do you mean? We quote it every Christmas. For unto us, we're born this day. He is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Well, how is Jesus the everlasting Father as deity? So now going back 
just before we get to your notes, now going back to last week, when we talked about the creating of God, the originator of God, the deity of God speaking everything into existence, and how in verse 2 of John chapter 1, it says that all things were created by him, talking about basically about his humanity, the word, that which became flesh. So now what you can look at, God created everything with him in mind. Okay? Yeah. With what he was going to become. Because remember that this man was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So God's plan originated before. Max Lucado says it perfectly, and I've used it as a Christmas narration in our Christmas program, and I've read it, I've spoken it, but he goes through the whole thing, and he says, then the author puts down the pen and says, let there be light. He writes the whole story. When he gets done writing the story, he puts the pen down, and he says, let there be light. Before that all happened, all this was already in the works. So when he's creating, for instance, when we created, quote unquote, this building, we had several things in mind. We wanted to have enough seating for people. We wanted to have it structured a certain way. We wanted to be able to do certain things. And so as we were making our plans, we were planning with that in mind. God, as he did his plans, was planning with how he was going to make a way for you and I to get to him. So that's how... It wasn't because the man, Christ Jesus, was back there at the beginning helping God create. No, no, no. He was, cre he was, the, he was the blueprint, the Logos of John 1.1 1, 1 that we talked about last week. He was the blueprint by which God created all things. And then in chapter, four, or chapter 1, verse 14 that we're getting into now, all of a sudden the Bible says the word became flesh. What became flesh? The blueprint became flesh. But the blueprint was already the, the, uh, claimed in verse 1 to be God. So God became flesh and dwelt among us. You're fine. No, 14. <laughs> no, 14. So we're at, we're at verse number 14 of John chapter 1. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the second half of that, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I'm hoping that that's pretty clear about what we're talking about here, God becoming a man. But then it says, we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Well, what's the only begotten of the Father? Was it another being? No, it was his humanity. We beheld the thing that God begat. Okay? Couldn't be co-eternal if he was begotten. And we're going to talk about the word begotten here in a minute as well. But So this verse, verse number 14, if you want to circle it, write notes in it. I don't know if you're, if you're like me, I've got notes all over my Bible. But this verse here is the key verse for the entire book of John. He is revealing to us that God became like us and we beheld God. Now he uses it in terms of the glory of the only begotten. He has thought and wrote and talked about the abstract in verse one in terms of the Logos. We read about the word, the light, the life, and has made it familiar now with both the Jew and the Greek. And so now he quite simply says this word which created the world, this reason that controls the order of the world, you remember he's talking to Greek believers, has become a person and we beheld him with our own eyes. We saw God. And the word that Jesus, or that John uses here, it is a word that refers always to actual sight, that we're beheld there. It, it's always referring to actual sight. It's not you know, us saying, well, behold the glory of God as we're, we're just imagining it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an actual physical sight. And John also goes on to use the Greek word, um, it's S-A-R-X, which Paul uses over and over to refer to the flesh, the human nature, and all of its weaknesses and all of its liabilities. Now, this was so mind-boggling at this time, 
that a church, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, uh, rose up called the Docetists. Docetism, or maybe it was in our last semester, Docetism held that Jesus was really just a phantom. We did reference it a couple of weeks ago. Not just an actual human being, he was just kind of a phantom. But John destroys that when he gives eyewitness account of the flesh. They saw Jesus having to eat, having to sleep. They saw Jesus walking. It wasn't just a ghost walking around. And, and what really makes it stand out, now remember, he's writing this in 180, so it's 65 or 70 years after Christ has walked on earth, and yet he gives us the stories between the pre-resurrection and the post-resurrection when he is more of a ghost, where he isn't the flesh and blood that that when he can walk through walls. And, and, and so he's already experienced both sides of it. So why would he write in this one that we beheld his glory when he knows that there's going to be a difference in him after his resurrection? So we know that John is saying, no, no, no. I saw him in reality. And, and so we see that John uses certain words to establish uh, foundations that he carries throughout the rest of his writing. And in this verse, there's three more. These are what's in your notes under number nine. The first foundation that he gives us is grace. We beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And so this is, that's the first foundation. Now, listen, what is Grace. It has really two different concepts, if you will. Number one here in your notes, it always has the idea of something completely undeserved. Okay? It, it, it emphasizes the helplessness of man and the limitlessness of God. It's, it's undeserved. It's always got that idea. And then the second idea here in your notes is the idea of beauty. In the Greek, the word would be charm. Okay, so now let's read into this verse just a little bit before we go on to the second one in grace. Back here to my beautiful drawing. When John writes, we beheld his glory, the glory full of grace and truth, how does God reveal grace in this setup? Through Jesus. Okay, John is saying, we're, we're, we're now seeing the grace of God. Okay? Now, grace was evident in the Old Testament in, in certain areas and for certain people. But now it's getting ready to go grand scale. Okay? Okay? And what theologians will say is this is ushering in an era or a dispensation of grace. I don't know if you've ever heard that terminology. A dispensation of grace. There's a dispensationalist will teach that there's seven dispensations. The fifth one is the dispensation of grace. Okay? And it ushers in with Jesus and it ends with the church at the rapture. Uh, and then judgment comes back. Okay? I'm not a real big dispensationalist because there's a little bit of each dispensation within other dispensations. In other words, the Bible does say that God saw grace when he looked at Noah. Okay, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, so there is grace in the Old Testament. It's just not the predominant factor. But here's what John is saying. We beheld full of grace and truth. What he recognized now, remember this is 70 years, he didn't probably recognize it the first time he met Jesus. Okay? You have to remember that over, I'm going I'm to repeat that over and over and over for the next several weeks. He wrote this 70 years after the life of Christ when he wrote this. And so now 70 years later, he's sitting down and he's going, and we beheld his grace then. Revelation was coming to John as he was writing. Oh yeah, when we really saw Jesus, I was seeing the grace of God manifest before me. The undeserved beautiful sacrifice for me. I bet you he didn't see it the first time. 
Okay, but now after 70 years of preaching the gospel, dealing with people, talking to people, rethinking, I mean, I'm only 50 and I can look back at, at some things in my life and go, oh yeah, that's what was really going on. That's what I was seeing. That's what I was experiencing. Well, now John is writing and he's trying to explain to his Greek believers, listen, when the word, that reason that you were thinking about and looking for, when he became flesh, now I recognize the grace. So what is, what is John getting ready to actually set up? Calvary. Okay. He's looking, he's saying, I beheld grace and it was beautiful. So that the apostle Paul can come along and write to the same church in where John was writing, because John was writing in Ephesus, and now he's into the church in Ephesus. Paul writes this, not a, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, the, God tied it together in his scripture through two different people. Grace was revealed at Bethlehem and through the life of, uh, we wouldn't see the grace of God without looking at Jesus, the man, his humanity. It was an undeserved blessing to us. It has the idea of charm and beauty. And it has the idea of, of allowing people to see into the heavenlies. You see, we're going to see here in a minute that no man has seen God, but we see him in Jesus. Fast forward all the way to chapter 14 in a couple of weeks. Jesus and Philip are having a conversation. We see in verse 18 of chapter 1, no man has seen him at any time, but then Jesus looks at Philip and says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. You're looking at him, Philip. You don't think you've seen him, but you've seen him. For I'm standing before you. Okay? So John knows that conversation. And see, we can't remember, we can't write or read this in chronological terms because John is writing seven years later. He already knows the conversation that Jesus had with Philip. He already knows the conversation that Je uh, Jesus had with the apostle Peter when Peter said, Thou art the Son, that, or Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's already known all that, and so he's putting all this together, and he is putting it together so that we can understand it. But he's in initiating it or introducing it to us in this verse, saying, Grace came by its humanity. And then he's going to tie what that grace is throughout the rest of his book. Praise God. So letter number two there. The second foundation is the fact that Jesus is the truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus. Okay? So Jesus, in number one, is the embodiment of truth. Okay? He's the embodiment of truth. And, and what I mean by that is, is this. Jesus didn't just come to talk about God. He came to reveal who he was. Okay? Um, he, he was... So when Jesus later on in, in chapter 14, verse 6 says... I am the way, the truth, and the life. What Jesus is saying and what, what John is trying to say is that truth is not an abstract thought process. Truth is God manifest in the flesh. Truth is an understanding of who Jesus is. And, and, and again, I'm going to just throw some scriptures out at you some, throughout the, the week's because, again, John wrote the whole book, but in John 17, 3, John says it this way, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, and not a sin. It's, this is how important it is to know who God manifests in the flesh is. Because it gives us life. Why? Because Jesus says he is the life. So in this case, he is the embodiment of truth. He didn't come to talk about God. He came to show men who God was. The next one there, number two, Jesus is the communicator of the truth. In chapter 8, 
He told his disciples that if they continued with him, they would know the truth. He will make things clear because he knows how to communicate it. Number three, Jesus' spirit is the spirit of truth. He didn't leave us just a book of instruction or a book of... In fact, the Bible says that the, that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Okay? What gives it life? The spirit of Christ. The spirit of truth. Uh, number four, the truth is what makes us free. Jesus, we like to preach that scripture and talk about, you know, he who the Son is set free is free indeed. And, and we put it in, and, and not that we're wrong in doing it, but we put it into very tangible items, if you will. He sets us free from depression. He sets us free from despair. He, he sets us free from addiction. He sets us, that, that's the concept. But this goes a lot deeper than that. Okay, uh, and, and, here, and here's what I mean by that. When it says the truth shall make you free, what are what do we become free of? The law. the law. What does the law do? Condemns. Okay, and, and so when you're being set free, it's not just free of the. I mean, we can have despair on earth, and we can be set free of that. And that's wonderful. But this passage of scripture is going deeper than that. By God becoming a man. He is creating an avenue for you and I to take off the shackles of judgment, of condemnation, of, of not really the law. The law is the schoolmaster, but the law just identifies how messed up we are. Okay? It, the law is not a bad thing, but the law identifies what is bad, <laughs> which was us. Okay? And so when, when grace and truth comes... And when John later on ties it together that the truth shall make you free in John chapter 8, that what he's saying is the humanity of God, because you have to tie the whole book together, the humanity of God, the word became flesh, ushered in truth, that humanity made a way for you and I to cancel out all of the junk that we are, that the law has identified us to be. Because before his humanity was, was created, before God came as a man, God li had limited himself to the law. And the law will only get us to a certain point. And if you broke the law in one area, the Bible says you broke it in all the areas. And so God came up, because God is so pure, God came up with a way in order for you and I to not disregard the law, but to fulfill the law in the fact that as, in, as a man, he was perfect and sinless and he paid the ultimate sacrifice. And so what grace and truth does, grace is the undeserved gift of his humanity that releases the penalty of sin. And the truth is the thing that sets us free from the repercussions of that sin. Okay, so grace releases us from the sin. Truth sets us free from the repercussions or, or the, the penalties, if you will. Okay, so grace gives us freedom from judgment and truth gives us freedom to excel. It empowers us to become what God wants us. Grace releases us, truth empowers us. So it makes us free. Now, in number five, unfortunately, the truth can still be resented. The cynic said it this way, truth can be like light to sore eyes. And, and here's the reason why the truth can, can be resented. Because the truth reveals You see, I find it interesting in this passage that John uses grace and truth and not grace and mercy. Okay? Well, what's the difference? Well, grace is the gift that God gives to us. 
Mercy is the thing that God takes from us that we really deserve. But truth is the thing that empowers us to become. Okay? So there is mercy new every morning. But in this passage and in this concept of the Logos becoming a man, what he's not talking about Calvary yet. <laughs> he's talking about grace and truth. He's talking about what he's given us by becoming a man and what he's empowering us to do. Well, you can't be empowered to do something unless you recognize whether you can do it or not. The only way you can recognize whether you can do it or not is if it's revealed to you whether you have the ability to do it. Okay? And if you are living in sin and the truth starts exposing that, you will see that you can't do what God is wanting you to do until you get the sin taken care of. And somebody that likes what they're doing, when the truth exposes it to them, they can be resentful of it. Okay? Uh, number six, the truth can be disbelieved. I, I believe there's at least two different reasons. And if you want to write next to that, John 8, 45, I think there's two main reasons. Um, number one, they, they fail to, to believe because it's too good to be true. Uh, John 8, 45. It, it's too good to be true. And then the second reason, which I find more often that it's disbelieved, is that we as humans become so tied to the truths or the half-truths that we think we know that we have closed our minds and our hearts and our spirits off to receiving what God is, is trying to say. Okay? And so I've got to tell you that as many years of I, as I have tried to study this and break this down, I still am only scratching the surface. Barely scratching the surface. There's nobody that knows it all except him. Even John didn't know it all. Because remember, John was one of the brothers, the sons of thunder, that tried to nudge himself in. Okay. So, uh, and then the last thing here, number seven, the truth is not abstract. It is something that must be done. And what I mean by that is I have talked to people over and over and over through the years. Oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. Jesus is the truth. Okay, but does your life show it? Does your life reveal what you believe? Or does your life, in other words, the concept of truth is not an abstract, yes, it's true, but it's so true that it is dictating how I am going to operate. Okay? And then the third foundation is glory. Glory. The third foundation is glory. John uses this word over and over and over in Scripture. And the life of Jesus was a manifestation of glory. That's number three is glory. Number one, under three, the life of Jesus' manifestation of glory. In other words, to look at Jesus and to experience his power is to enter into a new glory. And I'm going to identify a little bit what glory is in just a minute. Um, number two there, the glory that he manifests is the glory of God. Okay? So, going back to this wonderful drawing, what was, and if you want to write down next to this Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, especially 5, 6, and 7, um, and 8. Uh, Jesus, or, or what is, we, we talked about this a little bit, I think, two weeks ago. What is the main sin of Satan? Right, but, but his actual sin. He wanted to be God. So he was claiming to be something that he wasn't. Okay? And when Eve and Adam were 
when they fell, when they listened to the serpent, what was the thing that was attractive to, to Eve and to Adam was that if they would eat of it, they would be like, so they tried to elevate themselves as God. So when Jesus came as a man, the Bible says that he came with no reputation. It's, a, it's what's called a kenosis text, a self-emptying text. That's, what the, that's Philippians 2, I'm sorry. Philippians 2 is a kenosis text. And what it is basically meaning is, as a man, Jesus would not do what Satan did or Adam and Eve did by trying to claim his d divinity. He was going to just, so he speaks in veiled terminology throughout his life, and because he was being an example to us, uh, the Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God or to grasp after God. In other words, he had every right to say, this is who I am. But because I'm trying to make a ladder, if you will, or a bridge between the chasm of humanity and deity, I'm not going to do what Satan did and what Adam and Eve did. For by sin, by one man, sin entered into the world, and by one man, hope and glory came. Okay? So when we see the glory of God, we're, we're talking about everything he did in his life. He was... I'm about my father's business and to the glory of God John 9 when the the blind man was was healed was for the glory of God okay Jesus could have he had every right to say for my glory but his humanity constantly deflected if you will or reflected to the glory of his deity it wasn't two different people it was his humanity and his deity in his humanity he came just like us and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And so in that Philippians passage, a Trinitarian will say that the son emptied himself out of what he was up here as part of God and gave all that up and came to the earth and emptied himself that way, okay? The problem with that is the, the, the Bible says that he was sent. So how could he self-empty if he was already sent? So. What Philippians 2 is revealed in the man or the characteristics of the human being of God. In his humanity, he, he had every right to do it. He could have zapped anybody at any moment. He could, he could have done anything that he wanted to do because all power was his. But he didn't on our behalf. And it's the reason why he went to the cross. And the Bible says he opened not his mouth. He could have called down the heavens. And destroyed everything, but he would have messed up the sacrifice that was to be for us. Okay, so the glory that he manifests is the glory that uh, of his deity, if you will. Number three, there, the glory is his own in John seventeen five. Jesus shines with no borrowed radiance; his glory is his, and uh, it's another argument, if you will, for John revealing Jesus as God. And then number four, the glory of God, or the glory is translated to his disciples. You can put next to that word translated, transmitted as well. He was given to his disciples. Okay, so now if we are his disciples, we are the body of Christ all glory should go to Christ. We should, everything that we do should reflect him because he has come upon us with his spirit. He has given us. And so everything we do, everything we say, everything we sing, everything we accomplish, we should be saying to the glory of God. It's all for him. Okay? If we're doing it the way Jesus said. Now, this concept of glory this concept of glory goes back to the Old Testament, and it's the word Shekinah. Shekinah. Um, it's spelled all different kinds of ways, so just make it up as you're writing it. Shekinah means simply that which dwells. And it's a word that is used for the visible presence of God. Shekinah glory of God among men. In the Old Testament, the glory of God would show up when he was very close. Um, and this glory was not one that sent terror. It was one that sent awe. 
and reverence. Okay? And so we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, is there any questions on the first 14 verses? Cheryl. Number seven, the truth is not something yep. it's abstract. It is something that must be done. Verse 15 to 17. John bore witness of him. This is talking about John the Baptist, not John the, the disciple. This is he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, except I want to um, I'll just give you a couple of points I don't even think it's in your notes here oh it is so I better give you the notes huh all you note takers will have it crazy okay so the passage then says there's three great things about Jesus here number one on his fullness we've all drawn on his fullness we've all drawn Okay, the word he uses for fullness is a, is a great word. It's, it's pleroma, and it means the sum total of all that is in God. Of all that is in God. We've seen it. Okay, now the only reason why he can say that is because he has experienced Jesus. Okay, and in experiencing Jesus, he's saying, I've experienced all that is in God. The fullness of what he is. Um... Number two there, from him we have received grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Uh, it's, it's an interesting term. It literally means grace instead of grace. And it, it could mean a couple of different things because it's a little it's strange. Uh, number one there, it may mean that in Christ we have found one wonder leading to another. Yeah, so grace upon grace, or grace instead of grace, one wonder upon another, one after the other. We keep seeing more and more of him. It also could mean, number two, that we should take this expression quite literally. And what I mean by that is simply that there are different ages and different seasons for different kinds of grace. Okay? So grace upon grace. I may need a certain type of grace for a certain season of life. I may be in adversity or I may be on the mountaintop. The grace that he gives me while I'm walking on the heights is different than the grace that he gives me when I'm walking in the valley. When I'm walking in the shadows, the grace is different than the grace when I'm walking in the light. Okay? And so John is saying here that grace upon grace, uh, we're getting it in all different measures, in all different places, and in all different kinds. And then number three there, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And uh, whether a man or woman liked it or not, in the Old Testament, life was governed by the law. And uh, you had to do whatever the law said, whether he knew the reason for it or not. But with the coming of Jesus, we no longer seek to obey the law of God like slaves, we answer to the love of God like sons and daughters. There's a shift that takes place. And remember, John's writing it 70 years after Christ, and he's saying there was a transformation that took place that me as a Jew, having tried to live after the law, 
and obey in order to please him like a servant or a slave, I can now look at him like a son. Now, verse number 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Okay, this is in your notes, I think I've got it written as the revelation of God. The revelation of God. Um, nobody, even in the ancient world, would ever disagree that there wasn't anybody that ever saw God. Okay? Um, but he goes on to say that Jesus declares him. And so he's saying three things about Jesus in the scripture. Number one there, Jesus is unique. Jesus is unique. Um, the word that's the begotten there, the word begotten, is a Greek word that um, the literal meaning is beloved, um, unique, individualized. Okay? So more than just the literal beginning of something, it, it's, it's, there's a uniqueness to it. There is a... Um, a belovedness to it. And so what we see here is uh, the beloved or the unique aspect of Christ as the son uh, with the father. Okay. Again, when you read that, it's easier to remember when you're talking about the father, you're talking about the deity. When you're talking about the son, you're talking about the humanity. The humanity is the beloved creation of his deity. Okay. And so then when it says, uh, number two there, Jesus is God. He has declared him. And then it says that Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. This is a Hebrew phrase that expresses the deepest intimacy that is possible. So the bottom line for verse number 18 is John is trying to say that in Jesus Christ, that distant, unknowable, invisible, unreachable deity has come to you and I. And so now God can never again be a stranger. In the Old Testament, God was a stranger. In the New Testament, remember, as John is writing this later on in his life, he's looking back and he's saying, I remember that. Now I know what that means. Now I know what it means when I saw Jesus act the way he did. He was revealing deity. Again, we have to remember that the, the people that wrote the scriptures didn't write it in real time. Okay? John wasn't writing down every night his gospel as they did each one of these things. He is taking a lifetime of memories and compiling it and putting it all together. Okay? I want to skip over and go down to verse 29. The, the other part of this, be up to verse, from 19 to 29, it's just the establishment of John the Baptist as, uh, of who he is and why they've approached him. But then he gets to verse 29 and Again, here's some more depth here that we need to look at. I don't think I have John the Baptist. Yeah, I just have the witness of John. That's 19 to 29 if you want to write that next to it. But the Lamb of God, verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. This is uh, something that Jesus, John could have meant here in a couple of different ways when he says, Behold the Lamb of God. He, John the Baptist was a Jew. His father was Zechariah, who was a priest, which means that John the Baptist was a priest. Because in order to be a priest in Jewish tradition, all you had to be was the son of a priest. Okay, so John, the, and, and it's part of the reason why they didn't like John very much because he was a priest that got on the priests. Yep. So did John see Jesus before all this? 
Yes, because they were cousins. They were cousins. Yeah. They were cousins about six months apart. Okay, so that's he just he left for Philadelphia. Yes, yes, that was John the Baptist that jumped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary revealed that she was. the revelation of him. Because here's what happens. Whether we know him from know him, the Bible says it this way in Romans 1 that nobody's without it. Nobody has an excuse not to know that there's a God. So everybody knows that there's a God. They just may not equate it to that or they may refuse to believe that or they may look at other things. But when you look at how the world operates in you know, the big thing in politics now is to follow the science. Well, if you follow the science, you're going to get to a God. That's the bottom line. You know, it, 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 the way it is. And so uh, there's probably an abstract knowledge because we're created in his image. Well, that's definitely the spirit of God. God will, will do that. Give me two minutes. <laughs> Give me two minutes. Okay, so there's four things here in your notes that John, when he says, Behold the Lamb of God, he's probably thinking of a couple of things. Number one, because he was from a priestly line. Number one, it may have well he been thinking of the Passover Lamb. The Passover Lamb. John the Baptist knew what the Passover was. And what the significance of the Passover lamb, who was, if you remember, a substitute lamb. Number two, oh, I already said this. He was the son of a priest, so he understood the concept of what the lamb was. Um, and then, If you want to write off to the side of this, Jeremiah eleven nineteen and Isaiah fifty three seven. Jeremiah eleven nineteen and Isaiah fifty three seven. It's a point that I didn't put in your notes, but both of those passages are beautiful pictures of a lamb. Isaiah fifty three is led like a lamb to the slaughter, yet opening not his mouth. And then the in letter C there, in the days of, uh, in those days, the lamb, and especially the horn lamb, was a symbol of a great conqueror. We don't read this necessarily in scripture. This is more in manners and customs and history. But how many have ever heard of the Maccabees? In the intertestamental period, okay? And the horn lamb especially became a symbol of a great conqueror. So John the Baptist, when he declares Jesus to be the Lamb of God, he could have been meaning any of those things. It's never really declared other than he's more powerful than uh, him. So now in verse 32, we'll get to where John the Baptist <clears throat> saw who Jesus was. Verse 32, John bare a record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon him whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John the Baptist had the revelation from God of who Jesus was, his cousin, when he baptized him when the Spirit descended upon him and remained and stayed. Well, he literally saw something. I believe so, yes. And, yes, because, that he, well, he says it. 
um, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Okay, so it's one of the reasons why I have become a little bit different about John chapter 3, which we'll talk about when we get to John chapter 3. That was a T. I was going to get off on a side road and let me get back to this chapter and finish this. John chapter 3 will we'll address some of this. But John the Baptist recognized, um, first of all, the dove in Palestine is a very sacred bird. It was not hunted, it was not eaten. The rabbis used to say that the Spirit of God moved and fluttered like a dove over. Um, ancient chaos, breathing peace and order and beauty to it. So it was at Jesus' baptism that the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And, uh, but you have to remember that the Holy Ghost, like you and I would know the Holy Ghost, has not come into existence at this point. Okay, remember John 7, the Holy Ghost was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 38, 39. So there's something different here than the baptism of the Holy Ghost that happens when Jesus is baptized in the water, okay? And here's what I believe it is, is it is, for lack of a better term, I know this almost sounds sacrilegious to some, but it is Jesus' new birth experience, okay? Again, in John chapter 3, Jesus says, Nic or Nicodemus says, can a man be born again by going and being reborn? And, and Jesus, you know, deals with it. And we're going to deal with that in, three, in chapter 3. But I believe that at the baptism, symbolically speaking, and in revelatory speaking, Jesus was born again. Okay? So how, how are we born again? Are we really born again? No, we're born again symbolically and spiritually. Okay? Jesus, I believe, was born of the water and the spirit as baptism. He went down in the water as a baptism so that all the law could be fulfilled. And when he came up, the spirit descended upon him and stayed on him. Okay? It's the only thing that I can reconcile John chapter 3 with, with the man Christ Jesus. If all flesh must pray, hunger, thirst, sleep, all those things, all men must be born of the water and of the spirit. When was Jesus born? That's the only place that I can find in scripture that lines up. He was born or he was baptized as he came up out of the water. The spirit descended upon him and stayed on him. That's the key. So I believe at baptism, when you come up out of the water, the spirit descends and stays. Another term, you're born of the spirit. Okay. Um, and we'll deal with that when we get to chapter three. Uh, when John refers to baptism here, he is, when, when he's referring to the baptism of the Spirit, he's referring to a different baptism. And we're, we're uh, it, it's still the same concept of being dipped or immersed, but you're obviously getting dipped or immersed, not in water. But what he's really saying is that Jesus is going to not only move on us, but he's going to remain with us. And not only that, but he's going to saturate and consume and totally envelop, dip, immerse, saturate, whatever word you want to say. We are just soaked by the presence of God, by the Holy Spirit, okay? And Jesus is the one that does that. It's the reason why the baptism of the Holy Ghost cannot be the birth of the Spirit, okay? Or the baptism of the Holy Spirit can't be the birth of the Spirit because the baptism of the Spirit comes by Jesus. And Jesus was a man. And he had a will, and he had bone, and he had flesh, and he had blood. And John 1.13 says that that's not how we're born again. Okay, we're born not of the will of man, nor of flesh, nor of bone, but of God. Okay, so it's two different baptisms, two different sessions, sections, if you will. Okay, so uh, in your notes here, John's baptism, number one, meant cleansing. And number two was dedication. Okay, now there's a lot of churches today that treat baptism like John's baptism. That it's just about cleansing and it's just about dedication. Uh, it's an action, or, or what's the terminology? It's 
the outward manifestation of an inward change. It's a public confession of your faith. Okay? That's John the Baptist. Okay? But Jesus baptized differently. Jesus' baptism meant that the person's life was illuminated. The life is strengthened. And the life is purified. There's something that happens when you're baptized in water in the name of Jesus that releases something that's not just now cleansing is there, dedication is there. It's not it's not delegated to the you know back 40, it's part of it, but it goes beyond just a cleansing, it goes beyond just an expression or a confession of your relationship with God, it goes to the fact that when you go down and it's just normal water, but symbolically what happens is God takes that water and creates an illumination. It's the reason why I have yet, in 30 some years of baptizing people, have yet to see one person come up out of the water without a smile on their face. Because the light of God shines through them and they cannot help but to smile. Okay, it means a whole lot more than just a dedicatory or a cleansing. There's something that gets illuminated on the inside of us. It's, well, here's what it is. We are made alive. Okay, for as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, uh, for by sin, or by, for by baptism, we should come up walking in the newness of life. It's a brand new life that we have. Okay, and it's strengthened and it's purified. And then verse 40 to 42, we have a responsibility to share his glory. In the church, we have too many Simon Peters and not enough Andrews. Andrew was characteristically the one that took second place. But he's also the one that was always introducing other people to Jesus. And if we had more Andrews and less Simon Peters, now they were brothers. But they were two totally opposite brothers. And we need to have more Andrews that are just invite people to Jesus. They don't need to tell them how to live. They don't need to break it down. They don't need to have all the revelation. They don't need to have the prophecy like Simon Peter all did and, and did all that. They just need to be introduced to Jesus. We need to have both Simon Peters and Andrews but somehow within the church mindset, it has been either spoken or received that Andrew was less than Simon Peter or put it into the vernacular of today. The saint is less than the preacher. Okay, I get up and declare the word of God, but who would I be able to declare the word of God with if I didn't have Andrews that were inviting people to Jesus? Okay, so we've got to have everybody doing their part uh, and, and that's what Andrew uh, brings to the scene in verses 40 to 42. And then the last passage there is Nathaniel, uh, when, when God calls, or when the Lord calls him to follow him. And uh, the, he was probably a cantankerous man. He was, he was probably not real friendly. But what caught his attention was when Jesus saw him under the fig tree. And there is some significance in that, in the fact that the Jews, to the Jews, the fig tree always stood for peace. It was one of the reasons why they had a problem when Jesus condemned the fig tree later in the ministry and caused it to die within 24 hours. And so their idea of peace was when a man could be undisturbed under his own vine and his own fig tree, if you will, and Jesus is saying, not only did he see Nathaniel sitting around, but typically went into the very depths of man's peace. And that triggered something in Nathaniel to call unto the Lord and follow him. Amen. Well, miraculously, and it's not even 8.30 yet. <laughs> Any questions so far? If we can make a copy of those notes from last week to, for Carrie to take. I just have one that's a little off topic. You know, okay, so when we're baptized uh -huh. and, you know, God 
last year is upon us and we come up and you know life is good and why do you think then that God allows us to act like Paul in Romans 8 where it kind of says I don't like to do what I do because I know it's wrong but I do it anyway and this drives me crazy and you can say it way better than I can but you know what I'm talking about I do um, because here's what you have to understand when you were born in the natural you had brand new life brand new breath and you still drove your mom and dad nuts. I did. I'll go ahead. <laughs> no, you were a perfect angel. I know. And, uh, but what we have to understand is that when you come up out of the water, you will become an infant. Okay? And now from that point forward, it doesn't matter how much even head knowledge, you can have this whole thing memorized, but something changes when you're baptized. There is a shift that takes place, and all that you learned is good, but it's like you're relearning it again. And it doesn't change even after years of serving God. The Bible uses this term, and I try to use it quite a bit, but line upon line, precept upon precept. Just because we're born of Him doesn't mean we have all of our eggs in a row. It just means that we're new. And so as we're new and we're growing, it's one of the reasons why I believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost is so important because the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the, the gift that God gives us to be our navigator, if you will, through all of that stuff. It, it strengthens us, it comforts us, it, it, it guides us, um, it reveals things to us. Uh, it's a gift that keeps on giving, quite frankly. And... Uh, uh, now the flip side of that is my former faith family um, took the baptism of the Holy Ghost as the new birth experience and you weren't even saved until you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and I think that is not borne out in scripture I think the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a gift of the Lord uh in other words, it's not, see where I was at <clears throat> was if you got the Holy Ghost, you punched your ticket to heaven, basically. Um, well, then if God didn't want to give you that gift at that moment in time and something happened, well, you know, then the excuse is, well, they're in the hands of God, you know. I believe that something took place in Simon Peter in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, or verse 40. When he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. There is an act that we do that can save us. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death, which is repentance, baptism, and the birth of the Spirit. Then God gives us gifts. And the gift of the Holy Ghost is one of the greatest gifts, if not the greatest gift that he can give us. <clears throat> but it's not something that... It, it, to me, it's vital because it's what leads and guides me. Amen. And it makes me see things through his eyes easier. I fight less with Romans 7 and 8 because I have the Holy Ghost. Where if I didn't have the Holy Ghost, 7 and 8 would be more profound or pronounced in my life. Does that make sense? Um, but the reason why we battle that is because we're infants. And we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're relearning how to live. Uh, just like when you're learning to ride a bike as a kid, you fall over, you scruff your knees, it, you, you think you'd be able to do it. Well, then once you get it done, you, you kind of remember it really for life. Okay? And uh, that's really what happens, I believe, in the new birth experience as well. Any other questions? Or comments? I want to take a down <laughs> And the other thing is, is just because you've been born of water and of the Spirit doesn't mean that your flesh is not there. You're still having to battle the flesh. 
And Jesus battled it too. Okay? Jesus battled his flesh. We don't like to think that, but he did. Here's how I know. Because um, you don't sweat great drops of blood if you're not battling your flesh. And you don't, in Luke chapter 4, there's a whole conversation with the devil. And you don't have that conversation if you're not. The difference is, is Jesus reveals to us how we can fight the same battles that he fought, we can fight it, and that's with his word. And if, if we consume ourselves with his word, not just to read something about him, but to really get into it and make this part of our arsenal, that when he does attack us, you know, for instance, when when the, the spirit of the adversary says you're not worth it, oh no, no, no. He says I'm the treasure. He says I'm the apple of his eye. Okay? Masterpiece of workmanship, he does not be ashamed, fearfully and wonderfully made. So, when we use the word to battle, it makes Romans 7 and 8 even easier. Amen. I'm loving this. I hope you're enjoying it. Good. And uh, next week, we will go to chapter 2. So, I'm